everybody. Thank you so much, all, almost 400 of you guys here worldwide. This is going to be awesome, okay? Emergency medicine, that's what we're talking about today. So let me just pull up my screen. You know, PowerPoint is always um, a little helpful. Let's get to this right here. Drop questions, comments as we go, and um, the moderators are going to help me to see them to make sure we get everything answered. So this is me. I'm Kavita Jackson. That is my email. Um, that is my blog. I will just tell you briefly that my 2020, you, you're not going to hear too much about COVID because I was dealing with um, breast cancer. So the week that pandemic started, I saw my couple COVID patients. Breast cancer happened um, and I've been playing from the sidelines. I went through all my treatments. Um, I'm in remission now. So that experience is all is up on my blog and on Instagram. Um, come find me, Dr. Kavita Jackson. So how do we get to be an ER physician? So I know many of you guys are in different phases of your training or, you know, through into med school or considering medicine. So here's what I did. You know, after graduating college, I went to the University of Michigan for four years. I got a bachelor's of psychology, excuse me, a bachelor's of science in psychology while taking some pre-med, um, the pre-med requisites, right? And then you take your MCAT. After that, I was not the greatest, the brightest, the most standout type of um, applicant for med school. So I moved to Philadelphia and did what's called a post-bac. That's a two-year program where I did some more rigorous science classes, had some um, additional learning to really strengthen my academic profile. Um, I took the MCAT twice and the second time I bumped my point up by seven points. Um, so that was really helped me in my application to show like, hey, I struggled a little, but I'm still interested. I did a post-bac. Look, I can prove that I have learned from my mistakes and I know how to do what I'm doing. After that, I went to med school at Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia. That's for four years. Um, then you start taking parts of your board exam. So step one and step two are done in medical school. And then I went to residency in emergency medicine. So emergency medicine residency is three to four years. There's a lot of pro cons between the three to four year um, thing. And that's kind of a, you know, a discussion for when you're starting to look at your residency programs. In residency, I um, took step three um, and then I graduated. So I did residency in North Philly, um, a level one trauma center, a, a, a large academic center, um, underserved population. It was it, it ex, it exquisite experience, I'll say. Learned a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. A um, lot of exciting things, lots of, you know, sad things, just the whole thing. The whole experience was there. Um, so 2019, I graduated as an attending. I graduated um, about six weeks off because I had two kids during residency. Um, and so I graduated in August instead of July. Um, and then I moved out to DC where I am an attending um, at a community hospital in Maryland. Um, I've taken my written boards and I have passed them. The oral boards are kind of eh, hung up because of COVID. So we'll see when we can start to hopefully take them later this year and then I can be uh, board certified. So as emergency medicine physicians, you can practice while you are board eligible. You start practicing kind of actually in residency technically, but as an attending official, you are practicing um, while you are getting your board certification. Then you can pursue a fellowship and we'll touch on those. So your journey can be anywhere. For me, it was about 12 years. Um, I did not do a fellowship. So a day slash the night slash a weekend um, in the life of an ER doctor. So we, days, nights, weekends, holidays, you name it, we work it, okay? No two shifts are the same. But when I show up to my emergency department that is based in a hospital, I show up, I sign out, which means transfer care of patients um, from doctors that are leaving. I'll take care of their patients. And then I start seeing my own new patients, starting with the sickest first. So in a shift, which ranges from eight to 12 hours, I'm, I can usually see, I'm usually seeing it, 10 different patients at a time, right? So different people, different ages, different complaints, different acuities. Some people are on the brink of death. Some people have stubbed their toe. Different workups. Some people are getting chest x-rays. Some people are getting CAT scans. Some people are running off to the cath lab. Some people need a band-aid or a tetanus shot and they're going to be headed home. 
So in a, in a shift, I'll, I'll manage about 10 patients at a time, um, but overall see 25 to 30 people um, in a whole shift. I make a lot of phone calls. Right now I have a secretary um, in our ER, which is amazing. She makes all the phone calls. So I just have to get on in the end when I actually have to talk to the person I have to talk to. Um, but I still, I, honestly, I make a lot of my own phone calls and communication, especially if it's um, patients' families and things like that. Um, a lot of patient advocacy. And what I mean by that is, when you come to the ER, you, you have some kind of problem, right? And you are looking to me for help to figure out what that problem is. Importantly, is this a life-threatening problem? Is it going to harm me today? I will do my thing. I will say, hey, shoot, I'm worried, right? My patient has um, an EKG that I'm not happy with. It makes me very concerned that they're not having good blood flow to their heart. How do I advocate for that patient? I call a cardiologist. I call the cath lab, I call some additional consultants, I can call an echo tech, radiologist, all these different people. And I say, this is what my patient needs right now, okay? The person in front of me is having something really bad going on. I have found it and now I need your help. Um, to help them. I need your specialty. I'm that bridge person. There's a lot of stuff I do on my own that is within my specialty, but I also know when to reach to other people and I advocate for the person sitting in front of me. So a lot of advocacy involved in my job. Lots of charting. Yes, lots of, you know, all of us are inundated with lots and lots of charting. Um, and then dispo, dispo, dispo. A lot of my job is moving people. As I'm taking care of people, I need to make sure people are moving. I don't have a lot of time to sit and chat chat sometimes and you know shoot the breeze with some of my friends you know my friends excuse me my patients um or build those relationships because as for every person that's coming in they have two people behind them that are coming in and collecting in a waiting room and you need some strategy to sort through those people are these people going home are they being admitted and then when my shift is done i sign out and i peace out so all of my work is contained to when i'm in the emergency department i don't take call I'm not doing work outside of work. Everything is within that shift. So this is a massive list, but what do I do? Like we talked about my training and kind of day to day, but what are the cases that I'm seeing? So any life or limb threatening emergency and everything else, this is a short list. I see these things on a daily basis. I'm very familiar with them, but they are a short list um, of all the things I'm thinking about when people come into the ER. Some things are more serious than others, you know, uh, like a gunshot wound, obviously, um, is general, it can be uh, more life-threatening than some of these other conditions. But a lot of them um, exist on a spectrum and just an idea, we see everything. This is what uh, my schedule, I think this was January of last year. Um, so what my schedule or a schedule for an ER doctor looks like depends on the group that you work for. And we'll kind of get into group practice a little bit. But many of us don't work for the hospitals that we actually physically work in. We work for groups. So I work for a small democratic group that is run all by ER physicians, which is a huge perk for me because we have a lot of say in how we're making our schedule and how we have our relationship with the hospital that we're working at. So in this particular month, um, generally I'm working about um, 120 hours a month, um, at least 108 hours I work to maintain my benefits. And on average, I'm working about two to four nights a month. Each um, shift is about eight to 12 where I'm working. It's eight to 10. The 12 hour shifts were just not for me, but some people like to work longer shifts and have fewer shifts over the month. It's generally very flexible and that's something I love about emergency medicine. Um, on average, I work about 12 to 15 shifts a month, but you know, if I was picking up all 10 hour shifts, I might be working like you know, nine, 10 hours a month. Um, and as I mentioned, I don't take call. We don't take call. We have um, a system that's called like backup or jeopardy. And that essentially means like if um, the volume, you know, you're on like a, a schedule like, hey, you might get called in because the volume is so high. Like all these people just came in and there's a mass casualty or, you know, something's going down or somebody called out. 
then you can get called in. But that's not the same as a call system where for 24 hours, you know, for this 24 hour period or whatever hour period you're on call, that you are going to get phone calls about patient care and, do, you know, being a doctor on the phone and making decisions and all that kind of stuff. The only call I get is we need help. And I already knew that that might be coming. So I'm prepared for that, but not the same as taking call. I hope that makes sense. So we talked a little bit about, you know, you do residency and then you can go practice. Um, and of my class, half of us in my residency class, there was 15 of us, half of us went out to just practice right away. About half of us went into fellowship. The list on the left, so addiction medicine, all the, all the way down to like toxicology, neurocritical care. We have people in NASA. We have people everywhere. We have people, you know, work. I know people that work with the Eagles and do all of their sports medicine stuff. Yes, they have orthopedists, but they also have ER physicians because we do a lot of that in the ER. Hyperbarics and stuff like that. That's a short list of the fellowships. So that's just a, some idea of you can go so many different directions with emergency medicine. Um, and then your practice setting. So academic, are you in a big academic center where they have all this research and you have all these consultants or are you out in the community where, where I am, you know, where my resources are a little bit less limited? Um, are you working in a hospital like I am or a freestanding ER because those exist and you have to transfer all your patients that need um, specialists or consultants or something to a hospital or an urgent care that's also there. Some centers are trauma designated, meaning there's a gunshot wound, there's a knife, you know, there's a stabbing. That patient is going to be like beelined, you know, lights and sirens to go to the trauma center. That's if an ambulance picks them up. Many of our patients don't come by ambulance, they come on their own accord. And patients don't you know, they don't know, they're not thinking about who's a trauma center, who's not, that's not what you're supposed to be thinking about a patient, as a patient. So as a non-trauma center, you can still be receiving patients um, traumatic injuries, and you still need to know how to manage that. Same thing goes for pediatrics or adults. You can be in a ER that's only peds, only adults, um, or has both. I trained with pediatrics and I'm very comfortable with that. So I see a lot of the kids um, in my ER, um, but between my two locations, one of my ERs actually has a peds EM physician that sees all the kids, which is awesome. Cause you know, I think peds are always, <laughs> they make me a little additionally um, stressed out when you're taking care of them. So it's nice to have a peds um, trained EM physician there as well. That being said, if you're in an adult only hospital, patients don't know that. They're not paying attention to this because they're not supposed to. You may still see kids and you need to be ready for that. Um, the available support specialty. So if you're in a large academic center, you might have you know, five neurosurgeons and, you know, someone doing Whipple procedures and all these very complicated um, surgeries and things like that versus if you're out in the community or if you're out in rural middle of nowhere, you don't have those people to back you up. You may be delivering all the babies that come in through the ER. I, you know, some of the people I wanted to make sure I had in my hospital was cardiology and OBGYN because I generally prefer not to deliver babies if I don't have to. And it's nice to have those colleagues um, to support you. But if it needs to be done, I'll do it. I've done it because it's needed to be done. Um, and then you see how you're getting paid. Are you getting paid a fixed salary for the year? No matter how much work I do, this is how much money I get. Or are you getting paid by the amount of work you do? There's pros and cons to both sides. Um, physician and APP coverage levels for, you know, those of you that haven't heard of APPs, um, that's advanced um, provider excuse me, advanced practice practitioners and providers. So like nurse practitioners um, and uh, PAs, I have, we have a lot of those in my practice and they are extremely helpful and lovely to work with, um, to have a nice balance of um, taking care of the variety of patients that come through the ER. Locum tenens is another um, thing and locum tenens is like a traveling doctor. You're an independent contractor going to where you are needed um, to staff their ER. So there is a wide range of things that you can do in emergency medicine and really anywhere because if you are on the plane and somebody passes out next to you, who do you want running up <laughs> to help you? The most helpful physician to you is going to be an ER physician. ER physician. That's not the only reason you should do it, and I've never been called up on a plane, but I'm just saying. So 
Here is a little bit about compensation from Medscape. This just came out last year. We, we do pretty good, okay? We're right in the middle at about 357. Um, okay, there's a lot of um, regional variability. So I probably, this is so sad to me. I'm living where I'm probably getting paid the least in probably most of the country. Generally the Northeast and where I am here in the DC Maryland area, unfortunately high cost of living a lower end of compensation um, for many physicians, including EM physicians. So people in the South, my people out in the, the West Coast, Texas, Cali, you know, Arizona, those are some um, places where um, they have higher end of compensation. My pros and cons, okay, so you, your pros and cons might be different, but my, what I really love about emergency medicine is the flexibility. Day to day, you know, as the jack of all trades, I make a lot of aggressive, heroic interventions, but I see a lot of immediate results. You know, you got that tacky dysrhythmia, you're not feeling good, your blood pressure is dropping, I'm going to push a medicine, great. That dysrhythmia is gone. You feel better. You look better. Your blood pressure is coming up. Great. I like that. I see a wide range of pathology. So, you know, compare your, you know, compare this field to maybe um, one that's more concentrated on one body part, you know, so it's nephrology, right? Or ophthalmology. You become a super expert in one organ versus like I said, we sometimes are called jack of all trades because we know a little bit about a lot of different things. Um, and that I thought was uh, pretty good. We don't take call. And, you know, this is up to you, the long-term relationships with uh, patients and follow-up. I think my general personality and experience in med school, I liked the, um, the dynamic relationship to the ER that I have with my patients. The cons, yes, everything is unpredictable. So if you are you know, you like things to go this way, A, B, C, and always A, B, C, and never any other way, or you don't, you know, don't like adapting to chaotic and dynamic situations, this may not be the place for you. Sleep disruption. This, you know, sleep disruption is a big thing. We are sleeping all over the place. We are, you know, there's always tactics where we have to try to combat this. Um, to, it's a work in progress, though, as an ER physician to get your sleep right. Um, there's days where, you know, I'm up 26, 30, sometimes 40 hours, but then I sleep for like, you know, an insane number of hours to catch up for the week. Um, that's something that needs to be worked out. And along with that, it's because we work nights, weekends, and holidays. I was actually transitioning, you know, before I was diagnosed with cancer, I was transitioning to be a nocturnist, which means just a night doctor, because um, I thought that was gonna help my schedule with managing my family and kids and other things I wanted to do in my life. So when I transition back to work, we'll see what happens. But burnout is a big thing. Um, and then relationships we talked about. Which of the following falls under the trauma category? lacerations, cellulitis, stones, GSW. Yeah, so GSW for sure. Lacerations, I will so say though, that's like that close second where lacerations um, generally could be under trauma because it's generally a traumatic injury that causes the laceration. So those people I would accept as well, but gunshot wound for sure. Does anybody have any questions right here at this point for me? Yeah, so we have a lot of questions and we'll get to some of the more like commonly asked and more pressing sure. ones. Okay. Um, I think that one of the main questions that people had was as an ER physician, you see um, a lot, you can see a lot of tough cases. And how do you work on not bringing that back into your home when you go home for the day <sighs> or the night? Um, that's, it's honestly a work in progress. That is a great super relevant question um, for this field especially. Ooh, let me not start crying, but um, <laughs> I'd say I learned the hard way because at some point I did bring this stuff home and it was just a lot to handle what you're seeing every day, but um, how I cope with it now. So I like to debrief with my colleagues around me and the people that have been in that experience with me, I guess, <laughs> hands where my hands were and that kind of stuff. Um, and just talking about it in that space of like, only you understand what, you know, only we just shared this experience. 
it's really challenging because of HIPAA and stuff. You also can't really discuss these experiences outside of this space. So talking to the people that understand exactly what just happened and what you're going through is ex immensely um, helpful. Like I, I told my residency colleagues, like complaining is like this coping mechanism for me. I think it is. It's not, it's not cool for the person that has to listen to me, but for me, it's just like talking it out. Um, I'll say I do talk it out with my husband as well. He's non-medical and I think that might help me sometimes. I have my mom who's a physician so we can talk medicine, but it's, it's knowing that you have done the best job that you could do for your patient. Um, you know, you had their, their priorities in mind. Um, so when things don't go your way, I think if you know that you have done the best that you truly can, um, then you can, you know, work through it and kind of move forward. But there's definitely those, I have, you know, people, <laughs> images and people that'll never leave me, but it, it's definitely part of the job. Thank you so much for yeah. sharing and being so transparent and honest. We appreciate that so much. It's real, you know, <laughs> it's a real part of medicine. We have to talk about it more. This, this is how we combat burnout and, you know, how this affects us. But it's it's all for a better cause and a greater cause. And I wouldn't change what I do because of this. It's kind of just what comes with it. So, yeah. Any other questions you want to? Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's do one more question. Um, there is a couple people that are currently scribes or looking to get into scribing. And as a former scribe myself, I really like mm -hmm. this question. Um, have you worked with scribes in the ER? And if so, um, what is your experience? Do they help? Do they hurt? <laughs> okay. Uh, let's put it this way. Uh, I love scribes. Okay. One hospital I use scribes, the other hospital I don't. I think it's highly dependable. It, depend, it depends on who your scribe is. So the concept of scribes, I think, is awesome. And for those who may not be familiar, they are <clears throat> um, trained in our vocabulary and charting and documentation and help us as physicians with our charting because charting takes so much time and it really takes away from our patient experience and, you know, the whole reason we went into medicine. So I think the concept of scribes is very helpful. Me being a very particular type of person, you know, I think all physicians are a little type A, and there is a lot of liability within our documentation. Um, we, you know, if you didn't document it, it didn't happen, and it doesn't happen it only happens the way you document it, essentially, right? So we get a lot of training on this. We take it very seriously. Um, so I like to have full control over my documents. So any of the scribes that I work with, I generally, you know, they're very good about learning your preferences. So I'll let them know like, hey, this is kind of how I write my notes. These things are must haves. Um, and if we're in a patient encounter, sometimes I dictate out loud to them so they know exactly what I want in my note. And I read every single one of them because at the end of the day, as amazing and helpful as they are, that's my name on the chart, and I'm the person that is liable for everything in that chart. So one hospital, it works for me where I'm just quicker on my feet. I'm just faster, just the situation. I'm the only provider there. So as the only ER doc, well, the only doctor on the whole first floor, I just work faster charting on as I go on my own terms. But at the other hospital, there's a couple of us, and for some reason, it just flows better when I have a scribe to help document and I can just run boom 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 you know five different rooms and I know my charts are done because my scribe did it so long answer Great. thank you for <laughs> explaining that uh, I guess yeah. we can move on now and then we'll get to more questions later on Awesome. Okay. I think we're almost to cases. This might be my last thing about, so this ER might be right for you. If you kind of jack of all trades, you want to know a little bit about a lot, or you have a lot of different interests, like not just one organ. Um, you like to multitask. Um, you can stay calm under pressure and chaos. You can handle and are interested in intense experiences. And I say that's good and that's bad, right? Delivering babies is like miraculous. Like there's some like gross aspects of it. I remember from med school and, you know, go, even now, but it's like, it's, you're bringing life into this world, right? Like that's an intensely good, amazing experience. Um, ER physicians, you need to get down and dirty. You're going to do whatever it takes for your patient. That's what we do. Any kind of body liquid, even non-body, any kind of liquids you can think of, I've been covered in them. Um, it's just part of it. 
that's just how it goes. Um, and procedures. So this is somewhere where when I was considering emergency medicine, I also um, considered surgery and OBGYN. Those were my three top um, specialties that I had considered. One thing I really liked about ER is that I got a really good balance of seeing patients and then doing procedures as well without being, I don't want to say confined to the OR, but without being full-time in the OR or doing those sorts of procedures. So I don't work in an OR, but I intubate, we do crikes, we do chest tubes, central lines, you know, ultrasound lines, defibrillating patients, you know, uh, thoracotomies, a lot of um, life-saving measures from these sorts of procedures that we are trained in. And many times we work with our surgeons and like trauma surgeons or um, our interventional cardiologists and different specialists to do these procedures. So I like that. Um, let's do a case and then I'll take some questions. This case is, so I wanted to give you a, a flavor of like literally what kind of stuff we're seeing and what, what I'm kind of doing. So this case is on abdominal pain. It's a 70 year old, um, sharp intermittent right flank pain. That's kind of like up here to the side, never had this before. Nothing seems to make it better or worse. And he hasn't taken any medicine for this. So. Um, for those of you that are in med school or that have, have started learning in this manner where you're, we're getting cases, this will seem kind of familiar to you. You know, you're going to get an H&P and then we'll kind of work through the assessment and coming up with a plan. So his review of systems, I have a lot of um, acronyms in here. I will try to say them all out just for clarity. Review of systems, just for brevity, no chest pain, shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, urinary symptoms, fevers, or chills. Past medical history, he has hypertension, hyperlipidemia, coronary artery disease, and diabetes mellitus. Past surgical history, there is none. Social history, never underestimate the power of the social history. He smokes tobacco, he says no to alcohol and drugs, he is married and is a retired teacher. His medicines, I gotta move my screen over, sorry. His, the meds that he takes, he's on aspirin, lisinopril, metformin, and NKDA. He has no known drug allergies. So this is where I want to see your comments. This is how I make my differential, but I want you to give me a differential. What could this guy be experiencing? He comes into your ER, he's having this belly pain, he's 70, he smokes, it's kind of up here. Um, a differential can be anything, okay? I remember when I was a med student, I was too afraid to make my differential because I thought, you know, this is obviously not it. This is obviously not it. But that's how you actually use your differential. Put on anything that is potentially possible. And then you can go through each item and reason why it is or is not. And then you can take it off your list, right? So in the ER, specifically, I'm concerned about life-threatening injuries. So the way I was trained um, by one of my favorite attendings is think about three things that can kill the patient now, right? Because those are the things that I am the most focused on evaluating for, because if they're happening, I want to find it so I can put an end to them and address them. Then think about three less serious diagnoses. So in the comments, let's see, what do we have? How do I get to the comments? So we got oh, yeah, kidney stones. Stone. I can't read that. We got <laughs> kidney stones. Yes. Appendicitis. Yes. We have bowel ischemia. Um, yes. There are, there's a ton of kidney and appendicitis. Good, 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 good stuff. GI issues, internal yep. bleeding, liver, yep. um, bowel obstruction, cholecystitis. Yep. Perfect. Um, so those are the main ones that we see. Someone asked, when did the symptoms start? So there's, they're good looking question. for some. See, that's a great question. I don't even have it in my history. Uh, so if it's not there, it's probably not important. Let's say it started today. Okay. Um, UTI. Yep. yep. So gallbladder. So I think the main ones we have are appendicitis and kidney stones. Great. Totally spot on. I love it. Um, so here, let me, let me rock your world a little bit. The first one on my list is actually a STEMI, okay? That's a myocardial infarction. That's a massive heart attack. I don't think I heard that one, but I'll tell you why. Atypical STEMIs, okay, um, are pretty prominent in 
people of African American race, older age, such as this gentleman, um, or who are diabetic or females. So atypical MI means that it's a mat, it's a heart attack that presents with atypical symptoms. So instead of chest pain, you have abdominal pain, for instance. This is one of those that, you know, it's like, you have to know to look for this. So this guy would definitely get an EKG for me. STEMI at the top, he's 70, he's a smoker, he has known coronary artery disease, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, multiple risk factors. Um, but that's kind of a tricky one. Um, triple A, abdominal aortic aneurysm. So the big blood valve, you know, that big aorta is like dilated in your abdomen. And at some point it can leak or rupture. That's a kill you now thing. That's a minutes. You know, if it has ruptured, you have minutes. And mesenteric ischemia, I love it. Someone did mention that bowel um, ischemia. So another, another term for that is mesenteric, if you're talking about mesenteric arteries. Less lethal, and I think I heard all of these. So cholelithiasis, gallstones, or cholecystitis, when the gall, um, gallbladder is infected. Pyelonephritis, so urinary tract infection essentially is on the spectrum, right? This is um, the higher end of the spectrum when the infection has reached to the kidneys, that's pyelonephritis. <clears throat> and then appendicitis, absolutely. Even though he's in the right flank and it sounds a little high up for appendicitis, people can have retrocecal appendic appendices, which kind of point backwards. And for that reason, they can feel it in the back or a little higher up. So all great differential. These are not the only differential by any means. So on exam, his temp is 97.6, his heart rate is 101, blood pressure 78 over 44, 24 is his respiratory rate in 98% on room air. Okay, thumbs up or thumbs down in the comments on this guy's vital signs. He's good to go, he's not so good to go. What do you think? Um, so far everyone's saying thumbs down. Uh, yes. Someone said bl blood pressure is not good, low BP. Yep. Um, someone said his heart rate is a little too high. Completely agree. So those are the, that's what we seem to have getting. Someone you said both it. thumbs down. <laughs> yes, yes, both thumbs down. This guy, um, it, no, and, and if you look at the rest of his exam, so generally he's uncomfortable, he's pale, he's, he's sweaty, that's diaphoretic. His cardiac exam, so he's tachycardic, it at least sounds regular, so it doesn't sound like he's in an abnormal, you know, a, an arrhythmia. No murmurs, no gallops, no revs. His cap refill is less than two seconds, so that means he's perfusing well and getting good blood flow, it seems, at least to all his extremities. Um, his radial pulses up in his wrist are two plus, but his femoral pulses are a little bit diminished. His femoral and his dorsal pedalis pulses, so his groin and his feet pulses are a little diminished. Is that because he has coronary artery disease? I don't know. Is it because it's something else going on? I mean, I guess I do know. So yeah, it's because something else is going on. <laughs> Respiratory, lungs are clear to auscultation bilaterally, no wheezes, ronchi, or rails. Now his belly, right? He, he's here for belly pain. So let's see what this is about. He's kind of large. It's not distended, but he's tender a little bit everywhere. Um, and he's got a little bit of rebound. Who? Tell me if uh, you know what rebound is. And if someone can explain to me what rebound is, or for all of us, I guess. Someone said that it's pain when you let go, pain upon like release of pressure. Yes, absolutely. So essentially when I tell patients, I'll push down in an area and I let go. And I say, did it hurt more when I push down or when I let go? If it hurts more when I let go, that's a little unusual. And that's what we call rebound. The meaning of that is that there is inflammation in the peritoneum or peritonitis. There is some sort of acute, you know, what that translates for me is that there's an acute surgical problem going on in this belly. Like I need a scan of some kind or an ultrasound, something. And at some point I need a surgeon. So you're worried about a surgical belly, basically. Um, genital urinary exam, absolutely important with anybody who has abdominal pain, especially males. You know, you're thinking about torsion and all sorts of, you know, fornia's gangrene and all that kind of stuff. But his look normal. He's got no rashes, no tenderness. Um, neuro, he's a wake alert oriented times three and no focal deficits. What are we going to do? Drop us in the comments. What are you going to do, doctor?
I'm looking at all a list of all these participants and it's like so easy to call on people. But I know as a as a student of you know 12 plus years, I hated getting called on. So I yeah, want to so know. We got a doing? bunch of people saying uh CAT scans, EKGs. Um, yes. let's see. A lot of EKGs get some lab work. Um mm -hmm get some images ultrasound. ultrasound of the abdomen yeah yes okay you this is all awesome sorry I cut you off but I'm like so excited because you guys are so on top of this I love it so oh come on slides so IVO2 monitor that's like an ER mantra that you need to know for any sort of test that you take like you know anytime somebody's remotely sick IVO2 monitor slap it on yes that's great his oxygen is fine so he doesn't even need the oxygen honestly EKG yes Labs, you know, absolutely. If you want to get specifics, for those of you that know, recognize these labs, these are the ones I would get. I'd get a CBC, let's see what the hemoglobin's doing. The CMP, um, look at all the liver function. What's the creat? I want to see the lipase to see the pancreas. Um, coags, type and cross, right? Because I think this guy might be going to the OR, so I want to get his pre-op labs done. UA, to evaluate the urine and things we were talking about with the um, kidney, and possibly a troponin as well, because atypical MI is still pretty high um, on, on my list, although EKG is the money with that. He will need some fluids, at least on standby. I mean, well, actually going because his blood pressure is a little low and then actually some blood products um, as needed. And imaging, so CAT scan versus point of care ultrasound. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and then code status. So who, what are you most worried about in this man so far based off this information? I'm going to go back. Of these three diagnoses here, STEMI, AAA, mesenteric ischemia, the three things that can possibly kill this man in front of us, what do you think is the most likely thing that this man has? Uh, most people are saying AAA. We've yes. got a couple of STEMI and MI, but the overwhelming response seems to be AAA. Perfect timing. I don't know if you can hear it. We can't, but... Um... Okay, so let me at least show you. This is the aortic, abdominal aortic aneurysm here. And here they are measuring it. Um, excuse me, sorry. We do a lot of ultrasound every day, and this is why I wanted to include this. But here they me they are measuring it, and without getting into the super details of how to ultrasound and that kind of stuff, but you want um, your longitudinal and then your horizontal, uh, your measurements here. So you can see this is about six centimeter by five centimeter, and anything greater than three centimeters is considered an aneurysm. And then you see them pointing to this thrombus. This is what we call hyper echoic because it's it's picking up more signals you know compared to the blacks the black is what we call an echoic or hypo echoic so thrombus is now not only has this aneurysm gotten large but now we have blood that's starting to form clots within the uh, aorta and that's a problem because you have clots clots can start to occlude or block off the aorta they can start to throw off and become emboli. That's when um, little blood clots shower basically and go through your bloodstream and end up somewhere else. These, that's not nice. That's not good. Not good. Oh, now I can't get out of this. Okay, so this gentleman, absolutely, triple A. Um, at some point, you know, we will talk about the CAT scan versus ultrasound. That is, that's a, whole discussion to have about AAA, but it, it's, it's, you know, really relevant to emergency medicine. So when the transverse diameter of the abdominal aorta is greater than three centimeters or greater than one and a half centimeters of the internal iliac, so that's after it splits, you have a AAA. Um, surgery is indicated if you are a male and it's greater than five and a half centimeters in diameter, or if you're a female and it's greater than five centimeters in diameter. This is generally a pretty rare, it's four and a half um, per thousand people, and the majority are infrarenal. Um, but this is, you know, unanimously lethal without any sort of medical attention. 
Um, risk factors, a whole variety of risk factors. You can see them here, different conditions. Um, some of many of these conditions um, and things that our this patient in particular had. So screening, there is actually um, screening guidelines for this by the USPSTF. So one abdominal ultrasound for men age 65 to 75, a one-time ultrasound um, for men in that age group that have ever smoked, just to evaluate. The classic triad that you'll learn, so this is more of like a board, ex, you know, an exam type question. You get uh, the, the triad for AAA, ruptured or leaking AAA is back pain, hypotension, and a pulsatile abdominal mass. I can't say I've ever felt one, and honestly, if I was anywhere near feeling one, I would be so nervous about like rupturing their AAA. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but that is not you know, scientifically proven. So don't take my word on that, but that makes me nervous. <laughs> if someone comes in, there's something pulsing in their abdomen. But so only 50% of patients present with this. And this, the AAA is so diff difficult to diagnose sometimes until it's ruptured that only, a, I mean, a third of patients are initially actually misdiagnosed, um, you know, and they'll go home and come back with something else. Triple A's can also, um, they need to be under differential for people um, if they pass out or they're, they're having chest pain. So the diagnosis and management of this, the imaging, the gold standard, meaning the best test we have is a CT and geography abdomen pelvis. These are for your stable patients, okay? So I love that someone mentioned CT for AAA, you are right, but this particular patient who is tacky and hypotense and diaphoretic, I consider him unstable. And that's why he got the POCUS, point of care, ultrasound. Um, and that's something, you know, if you ever rotated through the ER, that's something we're very cognizant of. You never send an unstable patient to the, well, depends on where you are, they call it different things. You know, the tunnel, like the CT tunnel, the CT donut, the whatever. Never send an unstable patient to the CT because it's just really bad. And you don't want to have to code people on a CT table. We've done it. It's not pleasant. <laughs> Um, so if you're having symptoms like this guy, he, he's having pain and he looks awful and he's unstable, stat vascular surgery goes to the operating room ASAP, like do not pass go, go to the operating room for some definitive management. I can only do so much supportive and diagnostic work in the ER, but this needs a surgeon in the OR. In the ER, we do support. So we'll get our large bore IVs, we'll give oxygen if needed, continued cardiac monitor, um, you know, taking care of any arrhythmia. Yes, hemodynamically supporting with fluids and blood and um, stuff like that, and, and uh, obviously managing pain. Expectant management, as I mentioned, that's if you have no medical care and this is happening, this is universally fatal. Patients who have this, so you found this aneurysm, but they're stable, um, you know, they're having symptoms, but they're stable, you generally talk to vascular you know, surgery and they'll say, hey, you know, get them admitted. Maybe we'll take them to the OR in the morning or, you know, we can see them, you know, you, you'll consult with them and, and see what the next steps are. And then if you just find this, like for instance, you're getting a screening test and your doctor found this, um, then you follow with vascular surgery as an outpatient um, to um, monitor you to see if you need surgery in the future or not. So a pearl for you, I think I missed a pearl somewhere about ultrasounds in the past, but no worries. Here's a pearl for you, okay? Rectal bleeding in a patient who's had a triple A repair. So any sort of bright red blood per rectum in someone who's had their triple A repaired, that's an aortoduodenal fistula. They need, um, they need surgery right away. Because basically that aorta has now like, made a wall into their gut, their duodenum, and is leaking blood into their duodenum. That's how it's coming all the way down to their rectum. Um, so they need surgery. Second case is my last one, but actually, does anybody have questions right now? Yes. What should we have been most worried about with our first patient? That's like a trick question. We have MI on here twice. So I'm gonna guess MI is not right. That's some like test taking, you know, <laughs> test taking strategy there. And my husband jokes that I approach everything in my life as a um, multiple choice test. I like always cross off the things I know I'm definitely like not gonna do or not gonna pursue. 
Let's see. This is just for attendance. No right or wrong. We're just trying to see if you guys are paying attention. And then also while this is going, any questions you have about the case we just did or at this point? We have one more um, case and then we'll, we'll wrap up. I think there was one question um, asking earlier on, you mentioned with uh, AAA that it's lethal within minutes. And yeah. so since that was the diagnosis, um, did, did you do all the, was everything done within a matter of minutes, like your panels and your ultrasound? So I'll say um, this, so this was a leak. So this was a very small trickle, unstable, um, it's exactly how I was kind of saying. So unstable ultrasound, talk to vascular surgery, and they would be on their way. This is hypothetical because I've never seen someone survive a ruptured AAA. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, someone also asked, well, I guess since it's hypothetical, but someone asked mm -hmm. if you ended up getting an EKG and what it looked like. Um, but... Yeah, so yeah, so once again, sorry guys, it's a hypothetical, but yes, he got an EKG, his EKG. Well, the, uh, there's one person I'm thinking about in particular, but they didn't make it. So they, they did get an EKG. The person that I actually saw was alive, um, just like the whole surgery team was coming, running down the hospital, coming to get this patient. And he was just hanging on, but then he started to code. Um, and it was like a circle of coding. We just couldn't get him um, stable enough to make it to the actual operating room. But yes, Great. that person Thank did you. get an EKG. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. All right, so second case, we have a three-year-old male brought in by EMS and mom for shortness of breath for the last three days, um, progressively <clears throat> worsening, and it's, you know, he's got some rhinorrhea, some sneezing, throat pain, non-productive cough, um, no fevers, chills, no one's sick around him. He does have asthma. His mom said, you know, he ran out of his meds and his inhaler last month, and they're just not able to get in with their pediatrician um, to get a refill for whatever reason. His vaccines, always important for kids. His vaccines are up to date, including his flu shot, um, and always important for an asthma history. He's never been intubated, and his last exacerbation was about a month ago. So, Ooh. Past medical history, asthma, obviously, eczema and a peanut allergy, no surgeries, um, social, he's in preschool, he lives with his mom who uses tobacco and his dad and his older brother who has got some um, irritant exposure at home. His meds, pretty typical, um, you know, Zyrtec, Flovent, inhaler, albuterol inhaler as needed, um, pretty typical for asthma and no known drug allergies. All right, time for our differential. So drop in the comments. I want to know the three things that we could potentially kill this little three-year-old boy now. You know, we're not gonna let that happen, but just to make sure we get this right, we need to think broadly. So anything, I don't care how close you are. You have a three-year-old that's having a hard time breathing. You know, I should have prefaced it's not COVID, but you know, technically COVID is on your differential. We have that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, 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 I just realized that. <laughs> I think other than COVID, people saying pneumonia, pneumothorax, uh, yep. um, anaphylaxis, bronchitis, yes. um, coop, coop, coop. Yep, croup. Croup, yeah, it's croup. croup. Yep. Um, pulmonary Water. edema. Yeah, there's yep. a lot of asthma and allergy in here too. Oh, good. I was like, the only one I didn't yeah. hear for the asthmatic kid that short yeah, breath is asthma. asthma. Okay, great. Um, and all the people that said COVID, you're all right. I'm just kidding because now we think everybody has COVID for every reason. But so here's my list. I said asthma at the top, anaphylaxis, absolutely. Foreign body, that's one that's a little tricky. You know, well, I have kids. So I feel like at, as, as a parent, you just like become a little better at peds because you at least have some context to all those age times when everything is constantly changing in their development. But um, foreign body, you know, with the three-year-old, you still have to be a little careful. They're playing with them by themselves with, you know, small pieces. It could be foreign body. Less lethal upper respiratory, you know, just a common cold. Somebody mentioned pneumonia. Um, child abuse could honestly be on either list, but this needs to be on every single list for every single kid you see ever. And I don't say that to scare you, but I say it because we don't find things we're not looking for. 
So just to have it in the back of your mind, this is something always to consider. Fishy story, fishy injuries, just fishy interaction. Um, just always have that in mind. So this kid, I want to know what these vital signs look for you. Maybe a little bit more tricky because it's a kid. Um, hint, the, the numbers are the exact same as they were for our 70-year-old guy. So is this a thumbs up or is this a thumbs down? You can cheat and look at the exam if you want to. People said, some said up because their heart rate is normally higher in kids. Yep. Um, pe some people are saying down. We don't really have a reason. Oh, someone said the blood pressure is thumbs down for the kid. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they said up on heart rate, but down for blood pressure. Got it. I love that you guys, you know, went through very thoroughly and individually. I am not that detailed that I would have, you know, messed with you guys like that. But I like how you're thinking. This is how you have to ap approach real life, especially in medicine. Always be thinking the way you're thinking. That's great. So this is a thumbs up. This is a two thumbs up. For a three-year-old, these are normal vital signs. So whoever mentioned, um, you're right, the respiratory rate is higher. Their heart rate is generally a little bit higher and their blood pressure is actually a little bit lower. So I think the formula, you know, for a systolic blood pressure needs to be 70 plus two times their age in years. It needs to be at the very least that. Anything lower than that number is hypotense for that age range. So this kid is three, so 70 plus two times three, 76. Um, he, he's okay on his blood pressure. And this is why I bring this up because this is what I do. I bounce from a three-year-old to a 70-year-old to a 50-year-old to we are constantly bouncing back and forth. So I always have my pediatric vitals that's in my pocket because I cannot for the life of me, I couldn't do it in med school and I still can't do it now. So for those of you that can't, there's hope. You just get one of these pediatric vital cards and it has all the numbers there. Anyway, so generally, I'll skip through most of this. The kid looks good. His pupils equally round, reactive to light. He's got a little rhinorrhea, but the mucous membranes look okay. Uvula is midline. Neck is non-tender. Full range of motion. Does anybody know why I put this in here? Actually, I'm going to pause on the HENT exam. Since we're talking about scribes and documentation, there's a very particular reason, right? So HENT, his pupils are good. He's got a little bit of runny nose, moist mucous membranes, that's good. A little bit of redness in the throat, no exudates. Okay. Meningitis. Yes, absolutely. So as much as we, um, as much as we say the pertinent positives in our documentation, as pertinent are the negatives and the things we don't see. And by demonstrating and, you know, by showing, not telling, right, by showing and detailing what we do and do not see, we are actually documenting our thought process and what's on our differential. So you can tell, well, another physician or if someone wanted to come get at me for missing um, meningitis or something, and I'm not saying this is how you should think, but you want to be comprehensive in your documentation, you can tell that this physician has considered um, and e actually evaluated for meningitis. So it's possible the signs were not there at that time versus that they actually missed something. Anyway, heart looks good. His lung exam, he's got a little bit of wheezing, expiratory, and that's consistent with asthma. The belly exam is fine. Neuro, he looks great. Obviously, I'm not asking him about ANO times three because that's not appropriate for a three-year-old. So not only do my vitals change room to room, my exam and my focus changes room to room. Every, every patient I see, I'm doing a slightly different focused exam um, and skin no rashes. What are we going to do for this kid? It says abdominal pain, but it's not. It's shortness of breath. What do you want to do? Um, someone said refill on albuterol, chest x-ray. I have to like pause because that's like the most non-ER thing to say. That's at like that comes to like the bottom of our list because we're thinking about treatment and diagnosis and stabilizing. And yes, you are like a PCP at heart. There's a place <laughs> for you a in the world. The duo neb and yes. labs, chest x-ray. Someone said, tell mom not to smoke around her baby. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, those seem to be the, someone asked if you could explain what albuterol is. Yes, absolutely. So albuterol is a bronchodilator. It is a beta, beta 
agonist means it goes to the beta adrenergic cells in your lungs and it stimulates them to open up your airways. So you're a bronchodilator. In the Duoneb, so since you mentioned it, this, this is what I would do for this kid. Um, in, in Duoneb, it's called different in different regions. So I put it here. It's, oh, of course, I misspelled albuterol, but there's a U in there. Albuterol, the, um, the beta agonist, and then ipratropium is an anticholinergic. So once again, you have two different mechanisms of action trying to essentially bronchodilate and open up the airways and make your um, breathing easier. This kid I would consider some steroids as well if he's having a mild exacerbation and the steroids are going to decrease the inflammation in the next you know, 72 hours. Which steroids in the dose, that's a whole debate in itself. We could talk about that another time. But yes, re reassess in my general idea, my dispo for him is he's probably going home. He just needs to be tidied up with, I think someone mentioned all of these things, but not only will I prescribe those steroids, but I want to make sure he has that albu his albuterol inhaler plus some. I want to make sure as a kid with peanut allergies and, you know, all that kind of stuff that he has an EpiPen and some. I want to talk to his parents about, you know, the anticipatory guidance. Like if he goes home and starts wheezing, this is a real important one, don't bring him back right away. I never say don't come back to parents, but I say, you know, if he, essentially, if he goes home and wheezes, this is how you can manage it. And these are the reasons to bring him back. These are the reasons to be concerned. And if you see X, Y, and Z, you know, don't be afraid. That's normal. Because is this kid going to go home and never wheeze again? No, he's going to go home and wheeze. And we don't need the parents to bring him back the next time he wheezes. So just trying to give them a little bit of that guidance. But I always leave the ER open, especially with kids. I say there's never a wrong reason to bring them to the ER because with kids, you just never know. Um, strict return precautions, make sure close peds follow up. So I may get in contact with this pediatrician. I don't get in contact with all my patients' physicians, but this is one I would consider. And if you have social work available, getting them um, tied in so they can help help um, help this person get to their appointments because it's way less expensive, um, you know, and ideal to have prevented this encounter to begin with. And not to me personally, I'm talking about to the family and to the patient. So Pearl, so someone talked about x-rays. I was going to ask you why you want to get an x-ray, but this is a topic in itself. When we consider getting x-rays and radiation in peds, we have some additional considerations because of their young age. And with asthma, some, you know, depending on your practice, you may get an x-ray every single time. But some general rules to make sure we're not x-raying somebody every single time, you know, a three-year-old, he could have been to the ER three times this year. And does he need an x-ray every single time? I'm not I'm not so sure, but the four Fs. So if you're worried about a foreign body, maybe you have some unequal breast sounds. Maybe you saw a magnet on the x-ray, you know, or well, if you're worried about it, then you would get the x-ray to look for the uh, foreign body. If they have a fever and you're concerned about an infection there, like a pneumonia or a consolidation or, you know, empyema or something like that. Um, if you give them the nebs, you're like, this is bread and, bread and butter asthma. I gave him the nebs, but wait, he's not getting better. That's unusual. So failure to improve. Um, and then fracture, suspected child abuse. So these are reasons I would, if you're thinking about any of these things, definitely get the x-ray. Um, I think there is a question asking, um, would it be appropriate or would you feel comfortable having a talk with the mom about her smoking during the visit? Or is that something that you wouldn't touch on? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. And that's why I had started and included in this one, just to, once again, give you a flavor of jumping out of one room where we have someone with a AAA to this, where it may not seem like this is ER excitement and all that kind of stuff, but it is still incredibly important. And we do a lot of what I feel like is primary care work through the ER. And that's not because our primary care colleagues aren't doing a good job. They are just so overwhelmed. And we have a lot of patients with difficulty accessing or getting access to the patients or to their providers, but you know where you can go 24 seven with no insurance required. You know, honestly, even clothing is not required in our ERs. You can come to the ER. We're always here and we'll always help you. So I want to make sure we do our, you know, our best to give you comprehensive care. So 
I do think it's well within our um, job to do that. Good question. All right, so great job, doctor. We have a code rolling in in about four minutes. Cards is on the phone waiting to talk to you about somebody they're sending in and there's 22 patients in the waiting room. On to the next, my friend. Just a couple pieces of advice for anybody going into medicine anywhere. Learn a proper exam, undress the patient. I've heard this from uh, older generations that, you know, we always jump to CT and imaging and all this kind of stuff. And I myself have found things that, you know, I was ready to send to a scanner till I did a proper exam and the answer was right in front of me. Someone comes, you know, like classic example, someone comes in with chest pain, you order this whole cardiac workup, you didn't even look at their chest that they had zosters, you know, simple answer, that person doesn't even need an EKG. Find and stick with good study habits. If you remember from my beginning, like I struggled a little in college and I went to post back and it took me a while to find and figure, you know, that path out, but it was well worth it because when they say lifelong learning, you know, and I went to my interviews like, yeah, I'm so interested in learning forever for life. They're not kidding, friends. They are not kidding. I am still day to day reading journals and this. There's never a point where you're going to know it all. And just know that that's okay. There's so much information. There's always something to learn. So be open to that and make sure that you know how to learn effectively for yourself. Be honest with yourself about what you do and don't like. So money and glamour do not equal happiness. I could dozens and dozens of examples of this. Um, so just, just you know, if, you, if you're going into medicine, you're going to be okay. There's a lot of challenges, but there, you're going to be okay financially um, and, you know, you're, you'll figure it out. Fit medicine into your real life. So I was, I was going to say fit your, you know, don't forget to fit your real life into medicine, but no, it is the opposite. It is hard not to, you know, when you throw your 20s or however old you are, I threw my whole 20s and up until I was 32 into being a doctor. Like it was my life. And I had to find how to bring my real life into medicine until I realized, well, you know, breast cancer changes some things, but I realized it is flipped. I have a real life. That is my real life. I have my passions. I have my family. I have everything that I do outside of the hospital. What I do in the hospital is one part of me. It's a very important part of me, but it is one piece of me. So don't let it be your whole life. Um, White Coat Investor, excellent resource for financial management for people going into medicine. Um, and last point, hold your head up high, like be confident. You know, you want to know what you're doing and feel confident about what you're doing, but I will say not too high. Be humble, be kind, and listen. As a physician, you are not the coolest, smartest, fanciest, schmanciest person in the room. If you go in with that mindset, you will not go very far. So I work with a team, you know, all this amazingness that I told you I do day to day. I do it with a, uh, a team of people that I'm very close with and have a very good trusting relationship and the people that I, you know, lean on. And without them, I'm, I'm honestly nobody, you know, I'm like that ER doctor on an airplane that you want, but that doesn't have any tools, so I can't actually do anything. So anyway. That's, I think, all I have for you folks. Any, you know, I encourage you to check out these re resources, EMRA, um, ASAP, and then some phone apps for when you're in the ER or, P uh, you know, just any specialty, really. I think you could find um, these helpful. You've got my email, my blog, and please come find me on Instagram. I would love to hear from you guys. And I want to get rid of my screen so I can see your guys' faces. Is that okay? No, of course. Um, if you guys want to maybe turn your cameras and like wave or something, feel free to. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, there we go. There's Ellen, some face. <laughs> Tara, James. Oh my gosh, you guys are awesome. Steven, Erica, Pranya, Nicole. Okay. It would take me a really long time to get through everybody's, but thank you guys all so much for being here. Please, I'm, I'm going to stick around for a minute too. Um, I know we probably have some more questions and whatnot, so keep them coming in. Like I said, feel free to DM me or um, email me any additional questions that you guys have. Thank you guys so much for coming to the session. Um, 
I guess if you have any questions for Dr. Jackson, uh, maybe type them in the chat.